Good morning, and welcome to Greater Rose of Sharon Sunday morning service. Join us on Facebook Live at 10 a.m., and it will be repeated at 11 Sunday morning. Also, you can watch it in a rerun on YouTube at 6 p.m. So sit back, get your Bibles out, and join us for Sunday morning with Pastor Cedric Cross at the Rose. Good morning, Greater Rose. The song we're praising and worshiping this morning, it says, God is great. And he is worthy to be praised this morning. So if you are ready to praise the Lord, why don't you get on your feet and just praise the Lord with us this morning. God is great. Yes, hallelujah. Greatness of the Lord is inconceivable. Shown is unconditional. The power of the 
Good morning, Greater Rose of Sharon. And to all of you tuning in via Facebook Live, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. For those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, we thank God for you to all the visitors this morning. Listen, we just come to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And we give God glory on this morning, and we are looking for a high time in the Lord. Amen. Listen, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands.
Amen. We thank the Lord for one more sunny day. Amen. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is not promised. So we thank the Lord for one more sunny day. Amen. Thank you, choir, for blessing us. Amen. Reminding us that we ought to be thankful for just one more sunny day. Amen. It's prayer time. Amen. And we know that we all stand in the need of prayer. Amen. We know that in everyone's life we're all dealing with something. But God is in control of all things. Even when things seem out of control, in God's sight everything is in control. So this morning as we are all standing across the building, whatever your cares or concerns may be, there's no better place for them than at the feet of the master. We want to be praying for the sick and shut in, not only here at Greater Rose of Sharon, but all across this land and country. Amen. We want to be praying for this world. We know that there's so much going on, it's too much to name, but we know God knows all things. And listen, we want to be praying for the church, not only Greater Rose of Sharon, but every church that's assembled in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to ask Reverend Maurice Williams if he would come and intercede for us. Listen, whatever you're dealing with this morning, church, there's no better place for it than at the feet of the master. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, here it is once again, Lord, that a few of your servants have come, Lord, first of all, Lord, just to say thank you. Father God, we come right now, Father God, just thanking you for your grace and your mercy, Father God. Father God, we come thanking you right now, Father God, for being God and for being God all by yourself, Father God. Father God, we come thanking you, Father God, for loving us, Father God, when we didn't even much love ourselves, Father God. And Father God, we want to thank you for watching over us last night as we slept, Father God. And thank you for waking us up this morning and allowing us to see a brand new day, Father God. Thank you for allowing us to come out to the house of prayer just one more time, Father God. And Father God, I ask that you just be with us, Father God, as we go into this morning worship, Father God. Lord, I ask that you just allow the Holy Spirit to fall fresh on this place in this morning, Father God. Father God, we just ask, Father God, right now, Father God, that you just, just allow something to be said, Father God, something to be done, Father God, that, that will help us all on our Christian journey, Father God. And Father God, I come right now, Father God, praying for our pastor, Father God. Father God, I ask that you just be with them, Father God. Stand by them, Father God. Strengthen them, Father God, right now, Father God. Allow him to be the man that you are calling for him to be, Father God. And not only him, Father God, but we come right now praying for his family, Father God. We, we ask that you touch his wife right now, Father God. Give her strength to, to, to go with her husband and to stand by him, Father God. And Father God, I ask that you just be with the man who's going to break the bread of life on this morning, Father God. Not only the man that's going to preach here, but Father God, anybody that's standing to proclaim your word on this morning, Father God. And Father God, I come right now, Father God, praying for this greater Rose of Sharon church family. Father God, I ask that you just strengthen us where we're weak, Father God, and build us up where we're torn down, Father God. And Father God, if there be anything, Father God, that's, that's trying to distract what's going on at Greater Rose of Sharon, Father God, I ask that you just remove it right now, Father God. Father God, I ask that you just stand in, Father God, right now, Father God. Allow us to just stand together, Father God, that if one fall, that we, that we, the other one will not fall, Father God. Father God, just be with us and go, by, go with us, Father God. Lord, we need you right now, Father God. Lord, you said if we need you, all we have to do is call on you, Father God. And Lord, we need you right now, Father God. So we come calling on you right now, Father God, because we realize that we have no one else to call on, Father God. And Father God, just go with this church family, Father God. And Father God, I ask right now, Father God, that you just, just look out in this audience, Father God. Father God, but we realize that everybody is dealing with something, Father God. Father God, I don't know everybody's situation. I don't know everybody's problem, Father God, but, but I know that you know everything, Father God, and that you're able to do all things but fail, Father God. Father God, there's somebody here right now, Father God, that's, that's dealing with problems in their home, Father God. Father God, I ask that you just go into their house, Father God, Lord. I ask that you just touch and just fix everything that's broken, Father God. Father God, somebody has sickness in their body right now, Father God. But Father God, just let them know right now, Father God, that you are a healer, Father God. Father God, just remind them of how you healed the woman with the issue of blood, Father God. And you're the same God today that you were back then, Father God. Father God, we ask that you just go into the nursing homes, Father God. Go into the hospital, Father God. Touch those that are there, Father God. 
Father God, go into the jail houses, Father God. Touch those that are behind prison bars, Father God. And Father God, I ask right now, Father God, that, that you just forgive us all of our sins, Father God. And Father God, I ask right now, Father God, that you just continue to be with me, Father God. Continue to be with my family, Father God. Continue to bless us in a way that only you can, Father God. And Father God, I ask that you just, just forgive us of our sins, Father God. And Father God, when it's all said and done down here, Father God. Father God, when we have sung our last song, Father God, and prayed our last prayer. Father God, when there's no more breath left in this body, Father God, we ask that you just save us a resting place somewhere in your kingdom, Father God. And all these things we ask in your darling son, Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus is the light that shineth in me. The Bible does say to let your light so shine before men, amen, so they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven, amen, amen. Thank you, choir, amen. Listen, we want to move a little higher in the service, and that's worshiping through giving, amen. How many of you are happy to have something to give? Amen. Listen, that could be us that's standing on the corner hoping someone would give us a little change. That, that could be us uh, wondering where our next meal is going to come from. It, it could be us uh, getting our clothing from a, a relief shelter. But the Lord has blessed us. Amen. So we want to be mindful of those who are less fortunate than we are. We want to give a portion of what God has given us back to him. Amen. The Bible lets us know that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So at this time, we are yielded for over to our office. What time is it? It's giving time. And God tells us why we should give and how we should give. In Malachi 3 and 10, God tells us to bring the tithe to the storehouse that his house may have meat. Simply put, that means pay your tithe to support the church. And when you support the church, you're not only helping the church, but you're helping others through the church ministry. Not only that, you will be blessed. For God also said in Malachi 3 and 10 that if you give the way he said give, he will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. Don't you want to see the church blessed? Don't you want to be blessed? You can accomplish both by giving. Now to give to this great ministry, simply download the GiveLify app. That's G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y. Again, that's G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y. Go ahead and create that account. Enter the place of worship. Enter the amount you wish to give. Enter that credit card and billing information. Tap that Give Now button and smile when you do it. Because God loves you. Now, if you do not wish to use the Give the Fire, you can mail your tithe to offer any donation to Greater Rosa Sharon Missionary Baptist Church. 2823 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Little Rock, Arkansas, zip code 72206. Again, that's Greater Rosa Sharon, Missionary Baptist Church, 2823 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Little Rock, Arkansas, zip code 72206. And remember, Greater Rosa Sharon is a 501c3 charitable organization. All your tithes, all your offering, all your donations are tax deductible. Until the next time, this is Deacon Duffy saying God bless you and keep you is my prayer.
let the church say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. amen. There is no way that we can live without him. Amen. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Father, we come now in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. We bless your name, Lord, because you are worthy to be praised. We ask, Master, for forgiveness of our sins and shortcomings, Lord. And now, God, as I stand to proclaim your good news on this day, we pray, Heavenly Father, that the spirit of the living God would fall fresh on this place. We pray that your word would fall on good ground on this day. We pray that there be a sinner in the midst or even watching via the Internet. We pray that someone's heart be pricked and someone's life be changed. Lord, we thank you for everything being as well as it is. And Lord, we'll be mindful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all of the honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. We give thanks to God the Father and to his Son, who is Jesus the Christ, and to the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our teacher, and our guide. Would you agree with me when I say that it is good to be here? Amen. Amen. As I often say, someone laid down last night and did not wake up this morning, but God saw fit to allow you and I to see another day. And for that, we ought to be thankful. Amen. We praise God for another first Sunday. Amen. 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 To commemorate, uh, to remember, to reflect on how Christ's body was broken for us at Calvary. Amen. Listen, uh, you know, sometimes you, 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 you get ready for worship and you, you get your mind ready for worship. Get dressed and get ready to come to worship. Uh, uh, and even at your best, some sometimes, sometimes we just ain't just hitting on all cylinders. But you know, what God expects from us is to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and that's what God requires. So I'm just going to just, just try to clear the air. Choir, y'all did a good job. Amen. Musicians, y'all did a good job. <laughs> Church family, y'all did a good job. Because if you came to worship, then you got what you came for thus far. Because what God wants is what's sincere. There have been times, and y'all may not even notice it, there have been times I've been standing right here and I done jumbled words. I done forgot what I was going to say. I done had to try to find where I was in my manuscript. I've, I've done that right in front of you. But what counts is that we worship in spirit and in truth. And that's what God wants. So whatever, whatever we do, Listen, we want to do it for the glory of God. Are y'all in agreement with that? If you agree with me, say amen. 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 Listen, listen, there's a word this morning uh, coming from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. And the verse is going to be verses 16 through 18. Matthew 16, beginning at verse 16 through 18. And I know you've heard this before, but we've got to deal with it again this morning. Matthew 16, and we're going to begin reading at verse 16 down through 18. And if you have it, say amen. amen. And it reads... And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18 says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse number 18 again. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I, let the church say I, will build my, let the church say my, my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to talk this morning from the subject, the church belongs to Christ. The church belongs to Christ. Let's all say amen. amen. The church, brothers and sisters, is made up of a body of believers from all over the globe. And the church belongs to Christ. It does not belong to the pastor. He is the one called by God to serve as under shepherd and to feed the flock of God and to equip the saints. But the church does not belong to him. It does not belong to the deacons. They have been examined and proven to be faithful men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom that assist the pastor in the work of the ministry. Uh, they don't work for the pastor, they work with the pastor. But the church does not belong to the deacons. It belongs to Christ. It does not belong to the trustee or the finance committee. Although they are holders of the title and manage the financial affairs of the church, it does not belong to them. It does not belong to the individual who gives the most money, pays the most in tithes. It does not belong to the family with the most members in their family on the roster. The church belongs to Christ. And when you look at the root meaning of the word church, in the Greek, the word is ecclesia, which means those called out. In the New Testament, uh, that same word ecclesia came to refer to an assembly of believers, followers of Christ. And the New Testament church is founded by Jesus Christ himself. The church is an assembly of believers joined to Christ's spiritual body by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 13 and 14. For by one spirit, we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Verse 14 says, for the body is not one member, but many. We are all members of the body of Christ. We all have different roles and responsibilities, but we are all one body. And we are brothers and sisters, and we are made uh, one in oneness in Christ because of our faith and belief 
in Christ Jesus. Now, let's just be real about it. Since we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we know every now and then siblings fight. Uh, sometimes they, 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 they fall out over some of the smallest things. But even though we may disagree, we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. Somebody else say amen. And just like siblings at home fall out, but then they eventually come back together. And there ought to be enough love for the Lord and enough love for one another that when we do disagree, that there is enough love for the Lord and love for each other that we can forgive and move forward. That, that's what Christ would have us to do. Don't you want to know uh, the, the ultimate example of forgiveness? While Christ was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Now, if there's anyone who could have held a grudge, it would have been Jesus. If there was anybody who could curse someone for what they did to them, it could have been Christ. Matter of fact, even while hanging on the cross, keep in mind, there was never a point where he relinquished his power. Meaning that from the, from the unfair trial to him hanging on the cross, I need us all to understand that he had enough power to make all that stop. When they put the thorn on his head, he could have made it stop. When they pissed him in the side, he could have made it stop. He was never at the mercy of people. He could have easily made it all go away. But he knew that in order for man to be reconciled back to God, he had to die for our sins. And even though uh, they did Jesus very brutal, but he got up on the third day yeah. with all power in his hands. And after he rose from the grave, he hung around for 40 days still being seen among believers. And then he went back to go be with the Father. Ten days later, the Holy Ghost came. When we came and he came and on the day of Pentecost, and that is when the church was born. And Jesus says in this 18th verse, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. He says, I will build. So what's taking place, even now in 2023, Jesus is still building his church. He, he's not building with cement. He's not building with bricks and mortar. He's not building with sheetrock. But he builds his church by saving souls and adding them to the body of Christ. And sometimes we look at the local assembly. And some say, well, you know, Cross been here two, two years, a little over two years, and we have not baptized anybody. Some will say, the church ain't growing. Some will say, it seems like we're just doing the same old thing. 
Well, the Bible says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And there is more to his church than greater rose of Sharon. If somebody gets saved on the other side of the globe, he is building his church. If someone accepts Christ in another denomination and they have sincerely surrendered their life to the Lord, Jesus is still building his church. If someone who never watched this who never enters into a sanctuary, surrenders their life to the Lord in the hospital, out in the field, wherever they are, Jesus is building his church. And when we understand from a larger perspective that the church is more than the local assembly, then we don't need to be discouraged by what may appear to be uh, slow rolling, if you will. Don't you know somebody's having church right now? And two, five, 15 people somewhere will, will walk the aisle and take the chair and surrender their life to the Lord. Well, listen, we ought to be able to shout about that. We don't necessarily see it happening. We may not be there, but we know that the gospel is being preached all over the world right now. And somebody, somewhere, is going to surrender their life to Christ. That's why we can celebrate anyhow. It may not happen in the building. But it's happening because God said, I will build my church. Now, what we got to understand is that at the moment of regeneration, when we got saved, when a person puts their faith in the Lord Jesus, they become a part of the body of Christ. Now, every person should be a part of a local body of believers. Everyone should be a member of a Bible-believing church. Now, notice what the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 10 and 25 not forsaking the assembling of, your, of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We can summarize Hebrew 10 and 25 by suggesting that everyone go to church. Some will say that they are believers and they, they trust in the Lord, they believe in the Lord, but, but they're not a member of the church. Well, listen, where do you get your instruction? Where do you get your teaching? Where do you get the fellowship of other believers? It was not by design for us to be saved at home all by ourselves. Christ said, I will build my church. And we are all a part of his church. Now, God has ordained the church. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of God. His will. I'll read the beginning of verse 4, Ephesians 1 and 4. According as he hath chosen us, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He has chosen us. And we make up the body of Christ. He, because of the finished work at Calvary, and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, he established his church. Meaning that before the world was created, God knew those who would be a part of the church. He knew who would make up 
the body of Christ. He is omnipotent, having all power. He's omniscient, meaning he is all wise. He's omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere at once. That's why, and I've, I heard a seasoned preacher say this concerning prayer. He says, you know, you don't need to pray and ask God to be with us because he's omnipresent. He is always with us. We, we don't have to ask him to come on in the room. I, you, you know, we do that. Lord, come on in the room. Well, he's omnipresent. He beat us here. He, he's always with us. Uh, and, and when we consider the fact that he's always with us, when you have, Lord, have mercy. When you have an unpleasant exchange, when you are in a difficult situation, when your back's against the wall, when you're at your lowest point, God is with us. Don't ever let Satan trick you into thinking that you're all alone in what you're dealing with. It is not possible for God to be absent from where you are because he's omnipresent. He can't help but be there. So sometimes we feel isolated, feel like we're going through, feel like we're all alone, but that is not possible with the almighty God. Wherever we are, he is there. Truth be told, like I just mentioned, wherever we end up, he was there before we were. So let me remind those who may still be living some type of sinful lifestyle. You might have been able to slip and slide and get away from the people around you. But the Lord was there. Uh, that, at the little rendezvous spot. That don't nobody know about, but you and the other person. But the Lord was there. <laughs> uh, when you met up around the, around the way, around the corner, uh, and, and, and nobody knew about it, uh, uh, but the Lord was there. Uh, see, that'll, that'll mess you up when you think about it. Uh, yeah, you, you, you've been someplace and you thought, didn't nobody know about it, uh, but the Lord was there. And that ought to help us, brothers and sisters, to try to walk the straight and narrow. Because we cannot outwit or outsmart Christ. And the truth be told, and you don't have to say man because you might give yourself away, but there have been times where we felt like we didn't get over on God. Only for him to expose us. I'm going to tell you something that will help you. This, this will help you. When you go to God and repent of your sin, when you go to God in private, he does not have to expose you to the public. I'm going to say that again. When you go to God in private, he does not have to expose you to the public. You see, sometimes we keep doing and keep going. And sometimes... God has to do something to expose what's really going on on the inside. But if you go to God and ask for forgiveness, the slate is wiped clean. I don't know who that was for, but listen, if you got something going on that ain't quite right, today is the day to ask the Lord for forgiveness and move forward with the rest of your life. Amen. Satan will trick you into staying in a bad place. Don't you know all of us, the Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is beyond the hand reach of God when we repent and ask for forgiveness. If you're listening, say amen. Verse number 18, Jesus had not yet built the church. 
His death, burial, and resurrection are the foundation of the church. It could not have yet begun since at this point he had not died. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, we are baptized into the church by the Holy Spirit. So the church could not have started until the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which occurred at Pentecost. Right. And Jesus said, I will build my church. The church belongs to Christ. And since we make up the church, we belong to Christ. And we ought to be excited, we ought to be encouraged, knowing that we belong to him. Christ is the builder. This was not someone else's church that the Lord was just making additions to. No, he is the builder. And the role that we must play, brothers and sisters, is to keep lifting the name of Jesus. Keep lifting him up. John 12 and 32 and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. All we have to do, brothers and sisters, is continue to be faithful witnesses. Continue to lift up his name. Continue to speak well of him. Continue to bless his name. We do not have a heaven or a hell to put anyone into. Truth be told, we, we are pastor included, pulpit, deacons and on back. We all have fallen short, and we all have some things that we got to work out. But as long as we are keeping Christ first, he will get the glory. He says right here, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, watch this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, it didn't say that there wouldn't be some trouble. It didn't say that there would be no discord. It did not say that the church would not come up under persecution. Because all throughout scripture, and even now, we're living in a time where the church is being persecuted. And you may wonder, well, how is the church being persecuted? Listen, if you look at what's going on in the world, look at the laws being passed. Look at uh, how the government has, uh, is, is willing to stand by things, uh, stand on promises and principles that go against God's word. The church is being persecuted. And sometimes the persecution comes from within. The Bible does talks about wolves in sheep's clothing. And every now and then, when he reveals the wolf, the shepherd has to take a staff and run the wolf off. Because a shepherd protects the sheep. And when we, when we realize that persecution is coming upon the church, we have to be reminded that Jesus himself said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what Jesus is building, even though in times of turmoil, the trouble will not overtake the Lord's church. One man said it this way, God is always protecting the church. So that means that no matter what happens, when, when the phones start ringing and folks start talking and things start happening, Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail. In other words, we cannot lose. If you're victorious, you ought to say amen. Because we have victory in Christ Jesus. There are more things going for the church than there are things going against the church. And brothers and sisters, if we would just be obedient to the word of God, we are commanded to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, once again, omnipresent, even to the end of the world. 
Amen. Amen. And knowing that Christ is with us, that ought to give us the encouragement that we need to continue to press on. Amen. Continue to stand on the truth. Take a stand for what's right, even if you have to stand alone. <laughs> Sometimes you have to make a decision that folks may not agree with. But when you got the scripture to stand on, you can do what's right and keep moving forward. Once we can be obedient to the word of God, we will see Christ because he is, he is building his church and he builds his church by way of the believer. Christ is not, he has already preached his sermon on the mount. Yeah. He has already preached on the side of a hill. So Christ himself isn't going to come and preach by the hillside. But you and I, brothers and sisters, must share our faith. We must be witnesses. He speaks to and through us. And through our testimony of him, we share our faith and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he is the one who captures the hearts of people. And if we would just simply be obedient to the word of God and be good witnesses in due time, Christ will draw that sinner to himself. If we just continue to lift up Jesus, he will do the drawing. And sometimes we, we think about uh, churches that are seem like they're growing by leaps and bounds. It seems like that um, we may be watching a, a televangelist and whatnot, and they extend the invitation, and hundreds of people come. And then we've been extending the invitation for two years, ain't nobody came. <laughs> and we wonder, well, what are we doing wrong? Well, if the gospel is pre being preached, we're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> Because just like one day, it's just a handful of people. The Spirit of God could move in this building right here and 10, 15, 20 people walk the aisle and give their life to the Lord. It could happen. Peter preached on one day, 5,000 people came. Not included. Women and children. Peter preached one sermon. And all these folks got saved. And when you and I share our uh, faith Listen, God can move in mighty ways. Make, let me make a correction. When Peter preached, 3,000 came. Yeah. The 5,000 was when he fed the multitude. Right. Right. Now that was not including the women and children. Right. But looking at what Christ says, the gates of hell shall not prevail. There is nothing that Satan can do to stop the church. There's nothing that Satan can bring upon the church to stop Christ from building his church. No matter what tactic or vice that the enemy uses, the church will always be victorious. There's nothing Satan can do to stop God's will from being done. When Stephen was stoned in the book of Acts, yeah. the mob laid down their coats at a young man's feet named Saul. In the next chapter, that same man, Saul, who was being used by the enemy, yeah. in the next chapter, that same Saul who approved of one of God's deacons to be murdered. That same man came to Jesus in a dramatic fashion and went on a preaching rampage. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were told not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. They couldn't do a thing to him. And Peter and John said, but we can't help but tell the things we have seen and heard. Satan could not stop. 
the church from being built. And brothers and sisters, we must understand that regardless of what comes our way, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Paul went on to keep preaching. Peter and John went on to keep preaching. They had trouble that they had to deal with, but they continued to preach the gospel. Even though they faced persecution, they continued to lift up the name of Jesus. Even facing death, they continued to lift up the name of Jesus. Even after being stoned and left for dead, Paul continued to lift up the name of Jesus. Peter and John thrown in prison, but they continued to lift up the name of Jesus. And it was all made possible because of what happened one Friday on a hill called Calvary. <laughs> when they lifted him up between heaven and earth, Amen. nailed to an old rugged cross. And he hung from the sixth to the ninth hour. And the Bible says that he died. But the good story, the good part of the story is that he didn't stay dead because on the third day he rose with all power in his hands. And because he lives, he is still building his church. Yeah. Regardless of what is happening around the corner up the street or on the other side of the planet, yeah. the Lord is building his church. And as long as we just keep the faith, don't worry about what's going on, on that, at that church over there yeah. and that church over there. Yeah. Don't worry about what's going on at that other church over there or the church around here. As long as Christ is building his church to God be the glory. This is, that's the sermon right there. The church belongs to Christ. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's no way we can lose, brothers and sisters. I've heard someone, someone say this. Someone say, we can't afford to lose any members. Yeah. Well, let me speak on that briefly. <laughs> First John, in his short epistle, he says, if they were with us, yeah. they would have remained with us. Yeah. The fact that they are no longer with us uh -huh. is because they were never with us in the first place. Right. Right. That's in First John. Yeah. Now we're not trying to point out people but in the overall grand scheme of things when people turn and walk away from the Lord according to the Bible they were never his in the first place. Now some people haven't walked away from the Lord, yeah. but they're no longer engaged with the church. Yeah. Well, listen, some parents have a way with child. Yeah. That's still your child. Yeah. Yeah. They don't come around. They don't really talk to you. They kind of doing their own thing, but they're still your child. And as we learned in Sunday school this morning, yeah. sometimes the prodigal son yeah. will find himself in the hog pen. Yeah. Right. Right. And I'm trying not to preach another sermon, but the Bible says, and he came to himself. And when you come to yourself, then you can come back to God. So what, what, what does coming to yourself look like? It means going to God and asking for forgiveness. You're still his child. So for those, and now I'm talking to Rosa Sherry. For those who have distanced, them, distanced themselves from this church, well, God bless them. You still love them. They are still God's children. 
And whenever the doors are unlocked, they're welcome to come in. Yeah. I just told you, the church don't belong to the pastor. <laughs> and whoever decided to come on back in, praise God for them. Because they are still God's children. And if we love the Lord, and if we love people, listen, when that, when that prodigal son comes home, we'll grace him, gracefully, gracefully embrace, show our love, and welcome him back to the church. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. There may be one here this morning who has never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. There may be one here this morning who uh, is already saved, but you're just kind of trying to figure it out about a place to worship. You may be here today, you're saved. Uh, you have a church home, your salvation is secure, but you stand in the need of prayer. You, you, must, you may be in a rough place place right now and you just need prayer Jesus said my house shall be called a house of prayer so whatever your situation may be this morning you can come by letter Christian experience or a candidate for baptism but all the Lord wants you to do is come would there be one today Don't put off until tomorrow, which you can do right now. If you feel the Spirit of God speaking to your heart, be obedient to the Spirit and do what the Lord has charged you to do. Would there be another today? The Holy Spirit will not allow you to be at peace disobeying what he is telling you to do. When you're tossing and turning and you can't seem to get any rest, maybe that's the Lord trying to get your attention. If you're here, why don't you come? there be another today? If you're here, why don't you come? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.